Reluctant Preppers provides educational awareness and commentary only. Opinions expressed do not constitute personalized financial advice. Viewers are encouraged to do their own research and seek qualified personal financial consultation before making investment decisions. As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. It's been amazing the response that our video with this guest has gotten over the past month. Dr. Arthur T. Bradley is an EMP specialist. He's a physicist, an engineer, a scientist. He works for NASA in the daytime and at night he's working on a whole house EMP protection. That's what lit a spark of excitement across our community of viewers. Dr. Arthur Bradley, thank you for joining us again here on Reluctant Preppers. Sure, thanks for having me on. When we had you on, I believe it was early December, you talked to us about a new project you had just launched for developing a new device for whole house EMP protection. And I promised at that time, for our viewers' sake, we'd circle back with you to get updates and progress reports as you pro progress along uh, developing this brand new product. But before we get to that, we've got a raft of viewer questions we'd like to throw your way. Most of them have directly to do with the, the risk of EMP uh, vulnerability of our electric grid and so on. I want to remind everybody that today is Wednesday, February 13th, 2019. And if you're game for that, we'll jump on in. Sure. Shoot far away. All right. Now, this is one you've talked about before, and I think you can dispense with this pretty quickly. Doug M. asks, will an ammo can work as a Faraday cage? And if so, does it need to be grounded? Right. So I actually have a video on YouTube specifically testing an ammo can, a large 50 caliber ammo can. And the short answer is yes, it does a fine job as a Faraday cage. But if you really want it to do an outstanding job, you have to take out the thick rubber gasket that lines the inside of the lid and replace it with a conductive gasket, basically a piece of uh, squishy metal that you put in there. And I, I actually have some of those on my website, but you can find some of your own. Um, but then it gets you get over 70 dB of protection if you do that with the gasket, which is outstanding. Wow, that is oh, great. Yes. Uh, another question from Mike Marshall about a different kind of shielding. How far underground do you and or your electrical equipment need to be to be safe from an EMP? Yeah, so you as an individual are not really harmed by an EMP directly, even if you're on the surface. Um, but in terms of your electronics, it's difficult to say because I looked into this, oh, I don't know, about a year ago. And it ends up that it depends on what type of soil that you're dealing with. So if you're in very dry soil, let's say sandy soil versus very moist soil, like ag agricultural soil, you get distinctly different shielding uh, aspects from that. The short answer was at a minimum, you probably have to be about 30 feet down. And at a maximum, it could be 100 times that depending on the type of soil. So it isn't a viable thing to dig a hole and bury your electronics. People have thought about doing that. It just doesn't provide enough protection. But on the other hand, if you happen to be spelunking in a cave or something like that and you're down in the earth, you probably would see quite a bit of protection from the EMP. Wow. That's a pretty uncommon uh, situation for most people. Sure. Um, uh, the next part of the question is, I have a brand new still-in-box gasoline slash natural gas generator. Is it safe or better to leave it in the box unused and does that make it safe from an EMP stored this way? Right. So it doesn't make it 100 percent safe and it doesn't really matter if you take it out of the box or not. And even if you put fuel in it and start it and let it run a little bit. Um, but generators are pretty robust. The electronics in them is usually very simple um, ignition switches and those sorts of things. So if you buy a typical generator that doesn't have any solid state electronics in it, it would probably be OK. A lot of people try and cover them with conductive cloth or they build a little shelter around their generators. And that's fine. I think that certainly helped. Um, if you have one of these like fancy high tech generators, uh, some of the like Hondas and so forth, they have quite a bit of solid state circuitry in them. They're probably more prone to damage. So if I had one of those little ones like that, I would probably leave, put it in the box and wrap the box carefully or, or store it in somewhere that was shielded quite well. Um, so generators as a whole, the heavy duty ones in your garage are probably going to survive. A little bit of covering wouldn't hurt, but the solid state ones I think require a little extra protection. This is a question of similar to the ones you have answered in the past, um, but uh, Josh Venable asks, can I somehow fit my car with a device or devices that will shield it from being rendered useless after an attack? Is there some kind of Faraday wrap I can put over the computer of the car and other things that would need to be protected for it to operate normally? 
Right. Yeah, that's a that's a question I hear a lot. And uh, I know there's a company out, maybe a couple companies who claim to sell little modules that you hook in your car and they'll just protect your car from an EMP. And I can tell you unequivocally, as an electrical engineer with 30 years of experience, that's total malarkey. OK, so if whoever's selling that, you don't want to do business with those people because they're making stuff up. All right. So you have to think about a car as being maybe a thousand different small computers, right, spread all over the vehicle. And yes, you can wrap one box or yes, you can shield one cable. But to protect that system is very, very difficult and will require a great deal of study to do properly. Now, and you need that when you're running, right? When you're driving your vehicle, you need it to the whole thing to be protected. And there really isn't a way to do that short of having an engineer come in and spend a great deal of money and time trying to figure out how to solve your specific vehicle problem. Now, with all that said, if your car's not running, it's fairly robust and fairly uh, resistant to an EMP then, but many people still cover it with conductive covers to try and absolutely ensure that their car is gonna be viable after an EMP. Hidden City Prepper asks, Dr. Bradley, which concerns you more today, an EMP or a cyber attack on our grid? How would each distinctly affect our lives? Mm. Yeah, that's a tough question. Both of those worry me. Um, I think a cyber attack is certainly more likely um, because there's just different, a lot of different entities out there that can initiate that sort of attack on us. And we are vulnerable. I've been to several conferences and heard the talks, and we're very vulnerable to that type of attack. So I think it's more likely, although I think the damage would be quite a bit less than, let's say, a, you know, an overhead high-altitude nuclear EMP would be. I don't think it would be a national catastrophe. It would probably be, you know, take down one of our interconnects, perhaps, which would be horrible. There'd be all kinds of suffering and all kinds of challenges, but it might not be the same type of truly national crisis that took out, let's say, the entire grid and all of the interconnects in the United States. So the different different scopes, I think, the effects would be similar, right, for those people in the areas affected. The loss of the electrical grid basically takes out all of your infrastructures very quickly. We have one from Leah Gog who asks, if the energy from an EMP event wipes out electrical and electronics on the ground, wouldn't it also knock out all the electronics and satellites above it? Yeah, so an EMP can damage satellites in orbit, um, and it depends on where the EMP is detonated at, but it certainly can go both directions. Um, it's a little bit different phenomenon, though, and I'm not a, a physicist that can talk to that in great detail. Remember how a nuclear EMP works at the Earth's surface, right? You get an explosion, generates gamma rays. Those gamma rays essentially strip away electrons from atmospheric atoms, right? And those electrons then spiral around the Earth's geomagnetic field lines and they perturbate the Earth's magnetic field a little bit. And that at the surface is felt as these ground currents that essentially disturb our electrical grid and all that stuff, as well as this propagating RF energy, right? That couples into all of our small scale electronics. So having that atmosphere though is part of that transmission, right? And it's a little different as you go up the other direction because you don't have the same atmosphere. But with that said, I do know that satellites can be damaged by a high altitude nuclear EMP. This is not quite as high altitude, but it's also airborne equipment. Science O'Brien asks, hello, Doc. As an airline pilot, I'm concerned about how hardened are the flight control systems of my Airbus 320. Yeah. Yeah, I've been asked about that. Um, and I'm not, a, he's clearly more of an expert on airplanes than I am. What I do know is that airplane electronics are typically quad redundant, which means you don't just have a backup to your system, you have a backup to the backup to the backup to the backup, right? There are multiple levels of failure that they can tolerate. And the experts that I've spoken to over the years suggest that most commercial airplanes, even though they might experience an anomaly, one of those backup systems would probably remain functional and they could land the aircraft. Even if they couldn't do it in the traditional ways, there's all kinds of backup methods that they use for landing airplanes as well. And so their view was you wouldn't just have a bunch of airplanes fall out of the sky. Remember, airplanes get hit by lightning routinely. They have all kinds of disturbances that they feel all the time, and they don't typically fall out of the sky. Ziffer Homestead asks, and you've answered this one many times in different ways, but he's got some follow-on questions, and maybe you want to zoom in on one of these. Will solar panels be affected by an EMP? What safeguards can be used for an off-grid situation? And are batteries affected by an EMP? Right. So... Well, let's start with batteries first. So freestanding, um, like gel cell batteries, chemical batteries are not affected by an EMP. So if you just have, you know, your D cells or even a big car battery, you don't need to store it in a Faraday cage. It won't, mm -hmm. it won't be damaged by the EMP. Okay. Uh, with, all, with that said, if the battery is connected to a long conductor, let's say it's part of an integrated system, 
then the energy that develops in that system can backfeed into the battery and cause damage. So if you had a large solar power generation system, for example, you've got batteries as part of that, they can be damaged if that system's fully interconnected, the batteries can be damaged. Um, and the solar panels are sort of in the same uh, vein there. Uh, the testing that, that I'm aware of that's been done on solar panels, um, and the company I always give credit to is a company called Solark, and they make uh, EMP-hardened uh, solar power generation systems, probably the only ones that I know of in the United States, uh, and very good quality products. So they tested um, solar panels, just like you're talking about, versus uh, the radiated effects of an EMP, and the results were that they survived the EMP when freestanding, when nothing was attached to them. But when they were connected up as that integrated power generation system, they were indeed damaged just like about everything else in the system was without proper protection. So hopefully that answers that question. Now, how do you protect against it? Stay tuned. Um, you could certainly go buy a, a very nice, maybe a bit expensive, already pre-hardened solar power generation system like solar cells. And, and I'm sure they're fantastic. Um, that may be a little out of the price range of some folks. And I'm looking at developing a way of retrofitting existing solar power generation systems to make them more EMP hardened. So stay tuned. That may be a six, nine months off before I really get serious about that. But just know that I'm looking at it. Sounds good. Um, we've got this question you fielded before. In fact, you brought it up a couple of times before, but I want to get circled back with you because we have been hearing different takes on this. GT says, I've been told EMP destructive capabilities related to the effective range are exaggerated. The distance of an EMP using a pulse of most probable weapons at high altitude is not more than 300 miles in any direction from the blast point and would be shielded at 45 degrees in mountain valleys and caverns. Discuss the 300 mile radius concept, please, and can distance and geography help? Yeah, I'm not sure where the 300 mile number came from exactly. There are some fairly well-known um, maps that were generated as part of the EMP commission and there's other like the Meditech report and those show that a well-placed uh, detonation uh, at a very high altitude of the continental United States would basically cover coast to coast. Um, now, the fields are not uniform coast to coast. There's right. a complex right. pattern, almost like a horseshoe looking pattern that gets generated. Um, but remember, they don't necessarily have to be uniform, right? Because you're gonna couple a lot of energy into this electrical grid, which is gonna spread now in a conducted way, not in a radiated way. Um, but with all that said, yeah, geography plays a, a important role. And if you're down in a valley in between a couple of mountains, you're likely to see a lot less uh, RF energy, let's say, than, than somebody who's out on the plains, no doubt about it. Same way uh, some of the early studies were if you're close to water, uh, unfortunately, those levels tend to be higher. So if you're right at the coast or near big bodies of water, you end up tending to get higher fields. And there's some, been some reports written on why that is and the effects of that. So, um, yeah, geography plays a role. I think it's we're sort of a... a you know, uh, where our geography is is sort of where we are, though we can't really control that a lot of times. But I would say it's true. Yeah, geography can certainly affect the kind of fields that you would experience. This is a related question, and you may have covered it just now, but I wanted to really zoom in on it. Uh, Jason D. asks, how many nukes would it take to destroy the grid? I often hear one powerful bomb detonated 300 miles up would take out the entire U.S. power grid, but I've also heard that it would take actually six nukes at, high, at altitude to take out the grid. Which is it? And... Either way, is small arms fire to the big transformers a more likely scenario? So we'll talk about scenarios later, but in terms of the physics of one nuke versus six nukes that take out the U.S. power grid. Yeah, no, I haven't heard that either. Um, there's a lot of information flowing around, and unless there's some analysis behind it, I have a hard time knowing what's true or what's not. What I do know is that a single nuclear weapon detonated high at a very high altitude, let's say 300 miles or so over the continental U.S., will generate fields uh, across much of the U.S. that would be damaging to electronics. One wef one detonation would do that. Now, would that be enough to take out all of the interconnects in the United States? I don't know. Um, I don't think anybody knows that for a fact. What we do know is that it would certainly cause damage, and those uh, the power grid is not designed to withstand those kinds of fields and currents that would be introduced by it. That second part of the question was about the vulnerability of uh, big transformers to mm -hmm. small arms fire. Uh, I suppose you could damage things with, with small arms, but as far as how vulnerable the electric grid is to damage of specific point uh, locations, is that something that you your analysis has shown to be of significant concern? Yeah, I can't really speak to that. Uh, just common sense would tell me that, you know, there are a lot of large transformers in the United States, and certainly a terrorist could initiate an attack against something like that. 
but I just can't imagine that the scope of that damage would be, you know, anywhere comparable to something that affected much of the nation. This is an interesting one from Brian Jenkins. He said he understands from our last interview that coils that expect weak radio signals like radios, GPSs, cell phones, car, car fobs, keyless ignitions, and door locks that are unprotected would likely not survive an E1, but that windings on heavy electric motors, as in a car or maybe a furnace blower, may have enough metal around it to survive. But would the windings on small transformers, such as for battery chargers, 6 to 9 volt power supplies, cell phone chargers, or relays like refrigerators, dishwashers, and other appliances and cars that may not be purposefully sealed to survive? Yeah, I don't think anybody knows that answer specifically. Um, I think the, the person has it right. The things that are intentionally designed to pick up very weak RF energy, right, like radios, and they gave several good examples there. It's not the antennas, really, that get you into trouble. It's that those antennas are connected to very high-gain amplifiers that essentially try and clean up that signal and boost it to a level that you can use it. Right? <laughs> Be careful what you're trying. You're going to blow it out. Right? So the antennas are going to survive, and the motor windings are going to survive. You're not going to burn metal in two or anything like that. Yeah. But those amplifiers that are listening for whispers, all of a sudden, you know, they hear way more than they can handle, and they get damaged. Okay. Um Okay, the next one, you already answered a little bit. Maybe you're going to answer in the future. Michael says, is it possible to include protection for a solar panel to your DMC, DC EMP storm device or offer it as an add-on? So, we'll, Michael, we'll, get, we'll circle back uh, when Dr. Bradley finishes his first phase of his project and, and see what that one brings. Um, okay, he talked about, uh, this is an interesting one, and it, and it shifts the game a little bit, talking about polar reversal or pole shift. I understand there's a few different kinds of polar reversals in Earth geologic records. Can Dr. Bradley talk about the different kinds of pole shifts and how each affects us differently? If it ever does happen, we'll be susceptible to uh, reduced exposure damages of solar radiation or increased. And if we uh, come up to ground level, uh, how would we get protection from that solar radiation? So I don't know if that's getting mm -hmm. into an area that... It's too yeah, far it's stretching my knowledge. Okay. Um, I, I have done some reading on it just because it's curious to me as well. You know, we're, we're actually undergoing a polar shift now. Um, and there's just recently was an article published about how they've had to recalibrate where true north is yeah. just recently. Yeah. That's very, very small amounts, right? But the articles that I read suggested that it takes on the order of 20,000 years or so to fully reverse. So it's not like it happens in, you know, 15 days and north becomes south and south becomes north. So I'm not sure that the I'm not sure we have to answer that today. I guess is the point. But I'm not a true expert. You maybe you can find one that can come on and talk to that. Gosh, that sounds like you could have an extended period of time of vulnerability to increased uh, radiation if that's the if yes, that's the case. exactly right. Wow, wow. Um, okay, there's a couple of people talking about Van Allen belt radiation. Like, how did we ever get to the moon in 1968, and why can't we return there, and that sort of thing. There's different. There's two or three different people that are asking about that. Uh, does the, is that subject uh, one thing you've studied? Um, it's not my area of expertise either. I, I will say, though, that having I work at NASA, but I don't speak for NASA on this program. But we at NASA often talk about, well, why is it so hard to go back to the moon, right? And, and we're, of course, having various programs right now that are looking at doing that sort of thing, as are the Chinese and the Russians and, and India and so forth, right? Um, and the, the answer is that when we were back in the Apollo days, at least my answer to it, is that when we were back in the Apollo days, you know, like 5% of the GDP was used to fund NASA to develop this technology to get us to the moon. It was priority job one, right? Because we were trying to up, upstage the Russians, if mm -hmm. you might remember. And that that impetus, if you will, has died off some, right? The, the reward for cost benefits sort of rolled off. And now NASA's budgets, you know, $18 billion, something like that. But it's nowhere near 5% of the GDP. And so getting back to the moon on a much, much smaller budget, when all of those designs from the Apollo days essentially were scrapped and archived and nobody knows how to do any of that stuff anymore, um, is difficult. It's difficult to come up with all that new technology, with all the safety features we need to have nowadays. And as everybody's learning, going into space is difficult. It's a hard thing to do and to do it safely. This is an interesting one in the real world connection. Mark Robinson says, I discussed this issue with my buddy who's a utility line man. He said they are always scrounging for utility pole transformers. Damaged transformers are shipped out of the country to be refurbished, and new ones come from China and are always on back order. I asked him, what if we lost 20% of the pole transformers? His reply was, we would take from everywhere non-essential to restore necessary services, but the most greater cooperation would be 
oh, the most uh, <clears throat> greater greater uh, electric co-ops will be screwed for months. Other commitments, because of other commitments, and the transformers from China are junk. But uh, your assessment of the likely uh, timeline of recovery to a to a major mm -hmm. uh, damage suffered by the electric grid. Yeah. So certainly, if you go to these blackout conferences where this the grid down scenario is what they study, right? And and I've listened to some of those experts talk, and it's pretty grave. Uh, and I'm not an alarmist sort of person. I'm I'm generally pretty pragmatic, um, but it's very uh, it's very grave. You know, the large transformers aren't made in the United States, and they typically take on an order of a year to be made. And it's not like there's any stockpile sitting anywhere. And these are these are these are transformers that are building size transformers, right? Not the ones up on your pole. Um, certainly the ones on the poles could be damaged, but I'm assuming there's some inventory, even if there's, they're hard to get and you have to scrap and salvage. Um, I don't think it's the small ones going out that would be the biggest problem. I think it's those large ones that are so hard to make and so hard to replace. And I don't know that there's a solution to be had. I think that would be months at least before most of the country was back operational, and it could be much longer than that. This kind of goes to the other end of the spectrum. Uh, Suze Kofer says, Dr. Bradley, how can people without money prepare and how specifically mm -hmm. and how will it work? Yeah, well, it depends on what you're preparing for. If we're talking about an EMP, there's specific things, I guess. You know, an EMP is what they call a high impact, low frequency event, right? You hear mm -hmm. that abbreviation sometimes. It's a big deal, right? It doesn't happen very often. And we've never had an EMP attack on the United States. Uh, and same way with like a solar coronal mass ejection. A serious one doesn't happen often, every 150 years or so, but they do happen. And the question is, what, how do you prepare? And what I tell people is, first of all, don't focus on that specific threat. Get a general preparedness plan in place, food, water, shelter, all of the basics, right? Figure out how you're going to keep yourself fed and warm and hydrated. And that takes care of a lot of your problems. And then when you get that basis of, of protection in place, you can turn your attention to the specific threats. Like let's say an EMP has a specific threat of damaging your electronics. And you can look at how you, on a budget, can maybe protect some critical items that you and your family might have. Along that front, when we talk about the EMP storm, that to me is a low cost option, a few hundred dollars that you might be able to really protect some electronics in your home. That was one reason I undertook that project. But there are other things people can do if you had the small electronics that you really didn't want to lose Maybe it's a medical related, you know, you could store that in an in a inexpensive Faraday cage. People use galvanized garbage cans or foil wrapped boxes, things like that. And it's enough. It's enough to almost guarantee their survival. Um, so you can take those low cost approaches like that. It doesn't, you don't have to throw a whole bunch of money at the problem. All right. And uh, you've already touched on this, but this is so specific. I thought we could just zoom on this as our last question. Uh, Mr. Lion65 asks, how can a person EMP-proof a standby Generac generator that is already connected to the home? Yeah, I get that. I get that question quite a lot. And so, and people have tried different things. Okay, so first we'll talk about with an EMP, there, EMP, there are two threats, right? One threat is the radiated emission that comes through the air, and it's going to couple onto just about everything. All of our electronics are going to feel some of those high fields, right? And then the other threat is this conducted pulse that's going to get on every long conductor you can see, right? And that could be gas lines. That could be transmission lines from the power company, buried conductors under the ground, right? So these are going to have tremendous currents flowing on them. And the problem with the generator outside is it has some pipes connected to it, whether it's the gas pipes and whether it's the electrical wires. Um, and some of that energy is going to find its way along those conductors and find its way into the system, even if you cover it, right? And so what people have done is um, they've done a few things. So some people have built like conductive covers to go over their generators. Most generators already have a steel housing around it anyway. But and you don't want to cover all your air vents because then the thing may overheat if it's running, right? So what I tell people is the housing's probably okay. Um, you could seal up the seams a little bit better if you wanted with some conductive tape. And then at the very least, you could put um, a large ferrite around the power wires that go to and from the generator. At least that would help to suppress some of the conducted transients that came in. Um, and that's a low cost thing. You know, it might cost you $50 for a good ferrite or something like that. Not tremendously expensive. If the generator feeds into the uh, power box, into your breaker panel, you could use something like the EMP storm also on that breaker panel. And should the generator be connected at the time, when the event happened, it would also help to protect the generator as well. So it's another relatively low cost, but there's not a perfect solution that you just, you know, 
bolt something on and your generator is protected. Uh, and again, it's because of the conductive lines that run in and out of the generator. I would like to turn our attention, if we could now, to an update on your EMP storm project. That's what uh, got such a bunch of uh, views. It's continuing to just chug along at hundreds of views, uh, thousands per day sometimes. Um, right. the, your project EMP storm is a whole house EMP protection system that you're developing from scratch um, based yeah. on a different engineering design, uh, best of best of class ideas you've seen used elsewhere or even from your own research. Can you bring us up to speed on where you're at in that in that uh, development progress of that new product? Sure, sure I will. So let me just rehash sort of maybe what I said last time just in case somebody didn't see it. So I guess about, it's probably been five months ago or so, I took on this task. I, there's, a, there's a company out there that advertises that they build whole house EMP proof products. And I got a report from somebody, I won't say who, who had actually taken it apart and carefully studied what was inside. And they were just taken aback by the, the scam that was being perpetrated. I'll just say it that way, okay? And so I thought, well, why are they scamming them? You know, isn't this a possible thing? Can't we develop a surge protection system that would survive an EMP? So it can't be too smart, right? Can't have a computer in it. Um, <laughs> to protect against this conductor, this huge conductor transient. And anyway, so what I did is I first started off by essentially collecting every kind of surge protector there is on the market. So I got about 12 different surge protectors. I took them all apart and I looked at what was inside of all of them. And they all contained exactly the same thing. I was completely shocked, almost to the part level. Every parts were almost exactly the same. So it was like they had just found something that worked and everybody just adopted it. Right. And none of them would really protect against an EMP. Or a coronal mass ejection. So I, anyway, so I said, okay, let's see what I could do. My background's electronics. And so I started down that road of design and simulation. I'm a big simulator. I like to simulate everything, make sure I think it's really going to work before I put it uh, to hardware. And I got through that phase. I did the simulation. I posted videos of all of these things. And, and then I got to a phase where I built a prototype of it. In fact, I have the prototype here. I'll show it to you. Um, let me just show it to you now. So this is the prototype unit here. Um, it's a... It's a polycarbonate case. Um, I'm going to show you what's inside, but I'm not going to tell you what it is. <laughs> but you can get an idea of the contents of it. It's built up. Um, it's a three-stage. It's a three-stage surge protection device. All right? And the reason it's three stages is there's really three different stages of an EMP strike. There's the E1 event, which is this really fast transient that's going to come and affect everything, and and the EMP storm would help to mitigate that. And then there's this E2 that's sort of a little bit broader, but still really damaging um, that could come in on the conducted lines and the EMP storm specifically will suppress that. And then finally, there's this E3 long drawn out, kind of lower level, maybe a thousand volts, maybe 800 volts that will flow in on the power lines and that might slowly cook your house, right? Cook things in your house until everything either goes out or the breaker gets pulled. And the EMP storm is the first device that I know of anyway that is looking for all three of those and tries to protect the home from all three of them, okay? And does it in different ways, and and they're kind of clever in that they're all combined. Uh, I wouldn't say that they're like, you know, never thought of before, but put together in the way they are, I think it's kind of clever uh, in my own assessment anyway. Um, and so I'm at the prototype phase. I built one prototype. I've done a video of the very first testing, um, which I have on the YouTube as well. Uh, my YouTube's Disaster Prepper, if anybody doesn't know. And I have a video showing how the EMP storm will actually pull a breaker in the presence of an E3 conducted pulse that comes in. So its job in E3 is to disconnect your home. Mm -hmm. E1 it suppresses, E2 it suppresses, and E3 it disconnects your home. All right. Um, and so it, it, it's a video of that. And then I'm going to have another video soon of the prototype being used against these very fast E2 type pulses that come in. And maybe even an E1 if I can get a generator that will generate that. Um, so... That's kind of where I'm at. And once I demonstrate it myself, I'm going to have three qualification units built. That's going to be in the next three weeks. And I've already got some uh, a laboratory set up uh, up in northern Virginia that's going to run some mill standard tests on it, some EMP mill standard tests, as well as a lightning mill standard test, which are all very rigorous, and see if this thing really will survive the way I say it will. I'm, I'm confident it will. Uh, and then once those three are built and tested, maybe that's six, eight weeks from now, I'm going to go into production and produce about 500 of these units for people who have pre-ordered them. And if people, um, <laughs> is it too late to get in on that original pre-order? People can, is there a waiting list for people who want to, you know, sign up for, uh, to receive one after that? It, it's not too late. Um, it might be too late in a couple of months, but it's not right now. 
um, and they can pre-order them at EMPStorm.com. They're $300. Uh, I will say I thought $300. I based that price on a competitor's product, which was like $360. And I thought, well, I'll do it cheaper, right? And plus, mine's going to work. But I realize <laughs> now when you really put all those phases in there, all those different stages, it's a lot of parts. And they're very expensive to do high-quality parts. But what I decided going in was this. I'm going to do it right the first time. I'm going to buy the very best parts I can get. I'm going to do the best solid design. I'm going to test it to the highest levels I can. Nobody else has done all these mill standard tests. So that when I deliver it, if I die the next day, everybody will say, well, hey, I got this great product from this guy. Um, I don't want people down the road to think, you know, I bought into this sham. This product isn't any good. So I'm really going to go all out. And I think the $300 will probably go up in the future is all I'm going to say. We end up going up to $400 after these first 500 units. But for right now, I'm leaving it there. Uh, everybody's helping to kind of fund the development of this thing. It's pretty exciting to think that this is something that's never been done in this way before. And people are, you know, you're right on the, on the edge of it. That's pretty exciting. Yeah. Um, you mentioned before our talk, you even gave me a quick uh, sneak preview of another product that's not yours that you just became aware of. That's uh, the data bunker for protecting our data from an EMP. What's that about? Yeah, uh, and I they actually sent me one in the mail, so I'll show it here on on camera. It's I got it in the fancy bright orange color so that I don't lose it. It's it's basically a black box from an airplane or the equivalent of that or a train, and they have just tested the crap out of this thing. They have done uh, drop tests and crash tests and underwater and dipped it in uh, gasoline for hours. I mean, just every test you can imagine, including a nuclear EMP detonation in a, in a laboratory to see if it would survive. And it, they made it where it would survive all of those events. So it, it's kind of this indestructible black box uh, digital storage device. This one has 32 gigabytes of, of storage on it. Um, and the idea of it, and I just think it's pretty cool. I, I don't get anything from telling you. I just think it's really cool. It reminds me <laughs> of when you see a movie from the 80s and they're walking around with their with their uh, satellite phone next to their head. That yes. looks like the world's biggest 1980s jump drive or something like that. So go yeah. ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, you compare it to like a flash drive now, right? Yeah. Like the iron keys, which are really secure. And so this is a, a highly secure, but also, you know, I dare you to try and destroy me kind of thing, right? And it's not for everybody. I mean, they're not super cheap or anything, but if you had like, if you had a, an area where you wanted to store your most critical information that no matter what would survive, right? That you could recover from a fire or from an earthquake or whatever, it, it serves that purpose, I think. Um, and if money's not, an, you know, no object as it were to say, and that was important enough to you, I think it's a pretty cool product. I'll just say it that way. And I'm so thrilled that they sent me one. I'm going to use it and keep it. So what, um, where do people find out more if they want to find out more about that one? Yeah, um, I looked it up to be sure I was right. It's databunker1, the number one, okay. dot com. All right. So and again, I don't get anything from them. I just think it's pretty cool. They went to the trouble to build it. It is impressive when you see uh, solid, rugged engineering being done. It, it, it's heartwarming to see somebody doing something in, in a way that's going to last. It's so uh, becoming increasingly rare these days. So, mm -hmm. anyway, You're right. uh, any questions or final thoughts that you have for our viewers before we let you go? Uh, I would just say if you're interested at all about learning more about the the whole house surge protection, the EMP storm, there's a lot to learn about that. We haven't talked great details. Go to the EMPStorm.com website and just and just read what I have on there. I have five different videos right now where I'm talking about my different development phases, and I post a new one every couple of weeks as I work through this process. People like to see where I'm at. They're like, well, what's working, what's not working? So, for example, when we do the mill standard testing, I'm going to try and get a video of it, and I'll talk about the results and how all that comes out. Um, so if you want to go along the process with me, I think that's a good place to go. And I also talk about EMP threats and that coronal mass ejections and that kind of thing on there. So it's a good good resource page to go to. Also, guys, a couple other notes. Uh, if you want to support our work here so that we can keep bringing you these informative videos, please go to patreon.com slash reluctant preppers. And, uh, and also to mention that uh, Dr. Bradley, we have a playlist for him. So if you're a Dr. Bradley groupie, just look for a playlist for Dr. Bradley. He's got several interviews with us talking about different EMP and other risk scenarios and how you can mitigate those and lots of more viewers' questions that got answered. Dr. Bradley, thank you as always for joining us here on Reluctant Preppers. Sure, thanks for having me on again. They say the stock market crashed today. Yeah, I heard that. Sounds like people's retirement accounts and savings accounts are going to get bailed into the banks. Yeah. Looks like 
Pension plans and social security are going to get suspended too. I know. Sure, I'm glad we decided to put our money into gold and silver instead. Me too. Get your first ounce of silver at spot price and free shipping on any order over $99 at sdbullion.com slash rp. Hey, Reluctant Preppers. If you haven't heard, we've already started our monthly one ounce U.S. Silver Eagle thank you gift to one active Patreon subscriber each month, signed by your host, Dunnigan Kaiser. And you don't want to miss out on that. Please help us grow by subscribing today at patreon.com slash reluctantpreppers.